So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to speak about collaborative aid filtering and deep learning. So, it is two buzzwords. Um, so, I'm going to start. I'm trying to be a bit serious about it. So, first, let me introduce Bob. So, Bob is someone that likes to watch watching movies. So, one day he watched Inception and he said, Well, did I like it? Yes. He put five stars. He put five stars on the IMDb. And Bob has a friend, Tim. And well, Tim didn't like the movie very much, so he put two stars on IMDb. And days after, they went to see another movie, The Avengers. They do both of them like it. They put one ranking. They put the scores on IMDb, and they repeat the process day after day, until one day, Tim is not waiting the movie. <coughs> so, what is collaborative filtering? You may know already about that. Is well, which rating would, uh, what is the rating that Tim would have given to the movie? So, I'm assuming that nobody knows about the combination system, maybe it's a wrong assumption, but I'll go fast. <laughs> So in CN, if you try to gather all the ratings of every users, you end with a matrix. And collaborative filtering, if you have, if you have more users and more movies, it's the, it's the protocol that is going to find to predict the missing ratings. So the goal is to turn the sparse matrix of ratings, like this one, into a dense one. And why we do that? Well, if we can predict the ratings, then we can do we can guess which movie can be recommended. So in this case, in this case, Bob will be recommended the exercise. Some other techniques exist that are not going to try to predict the rating, but are going to try to rank uh, the movies one after the others. So, uh, I'm not going to go, to go into this detail. For now, I'm going to focus on how to predict the rating and how to increase the quality of this prediction. So, if we want to know the quality of the uh, trainings, then how we can do it? Is we are going to hide a few ratings from our uh, matrix of ratings, and we are going to predict them and to compute the error on it. And the more classic way to do it is to compute the root mean square error, that is to say the quadratic error on this predicted rating. So now neural networks. Well, you may have heard about all those Marbling's project that's been working with neural networks. It first started with numbers, how we can classify numbers. Um, when now we can classify about 1,000 different kinds of uh, dogs. And it's also possible to have Google Twins that make that generate pictures or even to use neural networks to play Go. So, what is the link between neural networks and collaborative returns? So, if we go on the very basics, a neural network is a model with some matrix of weight that are hidden here. And given an input, the goal is to classify if is it a plane, if it's a dog, and so on. So how is this going to work? First, we have an input. We're going to do a forward pass in order to estimate, to classify our object. Here, we're going to classify it as a card. And then we are going to compute a root mean square root and error on it. And the goal is to backpropagate, is to backward this error. Actually, it's supervised learning in a way for people who are familiar to it. And what is very interesting with neural networks is it's not in error and it works. <laughs> Which is kind of surprising to be honest. So, what is the link with uh, collaborative filtering? So, we have our classifier, but well, we don't want to classify cat and dogs. We want to have ratings. So, our output will be ratings, and the ratings will be will be long, will come from the matrix of ratings. Our in our and our input is a sparse vector of ratings. So, in a way, we want to turn a sparse vector of ratings into a dense one. So, 
So to do so, we're going to use a very famous kind of neural network, which is known as auto encoders. But one question that might arise is, well, are we going to have a line of ratings by users? So the so input will be all the ratings given by our users, or our input is going to be all the ratings given to a data. So we're going to do both. And we're going to analyze which one is going to work better. Do you have some guess for people to do the simulation system? Is user to user better or item to item better? Item? Yeah, item works always better. It's always better. <laughs> so what is the underlying idea? Well, we have our input. So no network is going to, uh, uh, to learn an underlying representation in these hidden neurons, and it's going to reconstruct, to predict the final outcome, the final readings. But what is the key difference between classical autoencoders is, well, in neural network literatures, we don't have this sparsity. In our pictures, if we have a look to music and so on, the input is always is already sorry, is always dense. So the big question is if we feed our autoencoders with sparse rating, is it going to work? So how we can do it? First, we have our neural network on the right. In order to remove well, in order to handle sparsity, what we're going to do, we're going to remove some nodes of our neural networks. Well, why are we doing that? Because we don't know the weightings. So if we don't know the weightings, well, we can feed the neurons with the networks with the with those weightings. And to do it, the easiest way is to put zero inside. But the zero does not mean well, it's not a, it's not a zero weightings. If you have a look to the mass, it means that the neuro, the neuron does not exist. It's just a simple trick. So we're going to do our forward pass to estimate our output. And then the biggest issue is well, in, while once our weighting has been estimated, it's impossible to check if it's right or not. Why? Because we don't have the weighting. So again, in order to remove our neurons, we are going to put a zero error. And again, if we have a look to the equation, it is like if we are removing the hidden the neurons. So if I try to explain a training state, first, we have our weightings. It's a sparse input. And we are going to change the unknown weightings into zero. And we're going to do an additional step. Why? Because our goal is to predict missing weighting. It's not to reconstruct the weightings we already know, it's to predict the weightings that we do not know. So we're going to force this behavior during the training. So the first thing is we're going to hide, to remove some of our weightings. Then we go a forward pass. We have our estimate. And we compute the error. Then once the error is computed, the unknown ratings are down to zero. And another key element is well, the error that the input that we're going to reconstruct are going to be built again. And that we used here, well, we don't care very much about predicting them. So we're going to balance them with a beta on the other on the other side, the ratings that we hide at the beginning we're going to increase that error by using an alpha metric. It's the noisy motor encoders for people who are familiar with the topic. And again, you backward, and you do it again and again. So you have your sparse matrix of ratings, you put zero, you hide numbers, you forward, you compute the error, you, then you remove the error for unknown ratings, you reweight, you backward, you train, and you do it again and again. But well, it's nice if you do it with, uh, find, with some example, but in real life, well, you have very few ratings. So it's very important to point it. Because again, neural networks have been tested on very dense data sets. You may have heard about word to vec and stuff like that, but actually the learning process, even if it looks like it, is completely different. We are not optimizing softmax, we are optimizing a witness error 
which has actually not been tried. So in order to know if it works, then we try with uh, some very public data, common data set, that is Mobilens. And actually, uh, I'm, I'm really telling the truth, it works very well. Uh, if, if you want to have a very, uh, this is a kind of state of the art in 2015, uh, which is LOMA, I don't know if you know it. It's a way, it's a matrix factorization technique. And in average, the root mean square error is 0 0.8, which means, well, if you try to predict the ratings, you are more or less 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 from the point truth. And it's a bit better if you have a look to uh, your known networks. VCFN, which is we auto encode uh, item to item, it's 0 0.77. So even if a very small margin, it can increase the final results by a lot of, by a huge margin. And for people that are very familiar with collaborative filtering te technique, ILSWL is definitely one of the most powerful and more robust factorization techniques that, techniques that exist. Even if it's uh, from an empirical way, and it really performs slightly better from, for it. And more importantly, if you run it on CPU, it's faster. So, well, okay. Matrix uh, neural networks are, are nice, it's work, it's marvelous, but well, uh, if neural networks were some collaborative filtering, there is some insight, some instincts that may explain it. So, if you're, if you're familiar with matrix factorization, the goal is, well, you have a lower match, you have a lower matrix of user, you have a lower matrix of items, and by, com by computing the scalar products, and you have, or not the scalar products, uh, you get a of dense matrix of rating here. And if we have a look to our neural networks, it's exactly what is going to happen. We are going to compute a nonlinear matrix factorization. So, actually, what is going to happen? <coughs> we are going to come to turn to turn the sparse <coughs> vectors of ratings into a low rank representations, which is dynamic. We relies on the input, which is actually a vector. And we're going to compute it with a weight matrix, which is the output, la the output layers. So the activation set. So if we use a common classic, so the classic notations, actually, the weight matrix here, this V, is exactly here. On every line here is activation. So when we pair from auto, uh, when we pair from collaborative filtering with auto encoders like we do here, it's actually a dynamic nonlinear matrix factorization. It's more, um, it has been explained in one in ninety one by Kramer when he worked on the topic. <coughs> so again, you that is encoded by the uh, hidden layers on V, that is the upper layer. So, why nobody try it? It's very easy. And um, the knowledge has been, has been around by uh, a lot of time. As, for instance, if you heard about the Netflix Prize, well, people would have been able to do it. And um, what's more impressive, they would have won. Netflix price with this algorithm. But, well, in my own sense, no networks have been tried with dense features, with dense input. So there are very few works about sparsity. And because there are very few works, there is no tool. So the first step we did was to implement a, a, a an open library in order to try this sparse network. And no, it has been released about two weeks ago by TensorFlow. So if you want to implement this algorithm in Python, it can be done in twin line. So it's really new, two weeks ago. And what is very interesting, for now, I was speaking about collaborative filtering, but it's possible to do, to add uh, heterogeneous data to any kind of neural you have. We wrote a paper, it's an archive, and it's, it's 
is the core stack issue because you don't have to preprocess your data. You can just put raw data, mix it with uh, uh, with uh, sparse weightings of vectors, and it works. Nothing more. And when you have very few weightings, it really helps to use training. Oh, another thing that can be done too, and it has been done by Spotify. Sorry. <laughs> well, instead of using the sparse matrix of ratings, uh, you can just put some music inside. And then, you can manage to learn the ratings by the music. That is the power of neural networks. But what Spotify do not know, for now, is they're using five second sample. But the new work is going to be delivered three or four months by uh, Ventures Lab that are going to use 30 seconds samples and may be as accurate as classic collaborative filter tools. But the input is no more sparse vector of ratings, is music or pictures, or anything you want. So I hope that we can see you at deep learning for a commander system at uh, this year. If you're interested in this topic, we're looking for PhD students or interns or engineers.